Welcome back to our series called Help, I Feel So, dot, dot, dot. Uh, In this series, we are naming, noticing, naming, and navigating through emotions and feelings that we have. And then we're looking at the promises of God and how God draws us in and through his word brings us peace. If you were here last week, we said that emotions aren't a bad thing. Uh, God created us as emotional creatures. As you look at scripture, God himself has emotions as well. It's not the emotions that are bad. It's when we get controlled by our emotions and our behaviors become sinful behaviors because they're driven by emotions. And so the series is designed to help us, like I said, notice, name, and navigate through our emotions and focus on the promises of God that draw us in and bring us peace. Today we look at uh, the, the feeling of anxious, anxiety. I feel anxious. Uh, when we talk about anxious and anxiety today, we're not talking about the, the normal concerns of life. Uh, God has created us with an emotion inside us to fight or flight. Um, and that's, that's a good thing. What we're talking about today is the anxiety that becomes overwhelming. The excessive worry of the what-ifs of life and and negative thoughts of what could happen, and they consume us. That worry, that anxiety, that's what we are talking about today. It's what I felt actually on a fishing trip a few years ago. I know, how can you be anxious and worried on a fishing trip? It seems almost impossible. Uh, But it was one of those fishing trips when we went, my uncle and I, we went to Canada, and, and we were flown in, and we were dropped off Uh, at a cabin on a lake, and we were the only ones on the entire lake for six days, five nights. It was awesome. But it was completely remote. No TV, no internet. Uh, The electricity was run by solar power, so if if the sun wasn't out and it didn't get enough power, we didn't have any electricity. (laughs) Um, it, It was way out there. And the first night, we're sitting at 9 o'clock at night, with literally nothing to do but to stare at the wall, when all of a sudden out of the wall came a mouse. And then it went back into the wall, and we turned and looked, and out of the bathroom came another mouse. And it didn't take us long to realize that this cabin is infested with mice. And so we went to bed, trying to get some sleep, and I'm laying in the dark, and all I hear is the pitter-patter of mice feet running across the floor, until finally I can't take it anymore, and I turn on my flashlight, and on my sleeping bag, on my stomach, is a mouse looking right at me. (laughs) I got no sleep that night. I got no sleep the next night. And by the third night, I had a panic attack. I'm not kidding, I had a panic attack because I'm on day three, I have two more nights before I can get out of this place, and there's just mice everywhere. And I had visions of, if you ever read the book 1984, uh, I had visions of a a mouse just getting on my face and eating me. And I couldn't calm down, and all I could think about was that. The worry, the anxiety during the day crept in tonight, and I literally couldn't sleep, and I had a panic attack. That's the anxiety we're talking about today, overwhelming worry excessive worry and concern and the negative thinking. How does a Christian deal with that? Because no matter who you are, you're going to have anxiety in life. But the good news for Christians is our life doesn't have to be dominated by anxiety. And that's what we look at today as we look at Philippians chapter 4. Before we jump in, uh, let me give you the background The Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the Christians living in Philippi between 60 and 62 AD. He wrote it from prison. Why was he in prison? Not for murdering anyone, not for stealing. He was in prison for doing what I'm doing this very moment, preaching about Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And it landed him in prison. And as he sat in that prison, he had no idea what tomorrow would bring. The emperor could order his execution the very next day, and he had no idea. 
He had no control. His life could end tomorrow. And yet he pens this letter to the Philippians that can only be characterized as with one word. Joy. Joy. And that's what we talk about in uh, Philippians chapter 4. How the Christian can have peace and joy and be released from their anxiety. Let's look at what Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Notice what Paul says. How does he begin his letter? He's sitting in prison, has no idea what the next day is going to bring, and he says, rejoice in the Lord. I will say it again, rejoice. Not rejoice when you're healthy, wealthy, and secure in life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And then, do not be anxious about anything. Well, that's easy for you to say, Paul. But Paul, honestly, you weren't married and you didn't have kids. So, you just have to worry about yourself. So, don't be anxious about anything. There's a lot of what-ifs that can happen to my kids. There's a lot of what-ifs that can happen to my spouse, and if they do, that leaves me with a big hole in my heart. Don't be anxious about anything, Paul. That's easy for you to say, but I have deadlines to meet, and if I don't meet my deadlines, that means I'm going to lose my job. Don't be anxious about anything, Paul. That's easy for you to say, but I'm sitting here waiting for results from the doctor. You don't understand, Paul. And yet Paul says, rejoice. Not in your circumstances, in the Lord. And don't be anxious about anything. Now, before we just think that Paul has his head up in the clouds and he's completely naive, uh, he's not. And he lays out a couple principles for us in this section of how a Christian can rejoice at all times and how we, how we can not be anxious, how we can actually live without the anxieties controlling us. In fact, Paul isn't unrealistic. He's actually very realistic. And as a Christian, you are too. We have the opportunity to be realistic about the situation, face the facts, and yet still not live in anxiety. Paul lays out a couple principles that we're going to cover. and I'm actually going to go start at the bottom and go back to the front. So we're going to start with verse 8 and 9, and then we're going to jump back up to 6 and 7. Paul says in in Philippians 4, whatever is true, no, I'm looking, there you go. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Think, Paul says. That word think in in Greek is the word legizomai, and it actually has a mathematical term. Uh, It's mathematically calculate and think about the situation at hand. And so you add, you subtract, You multiply, you divide what is going on to get your solution. You see, the Christian doesn't just get rid of uh, of the bad thoughts. The Christian doesn't have his head in the cloud or, or act like everything's okay when it's not. 
not like, uh, Christians aren't like that meme. If you've ever seen the meme where, with the dog in the, in the house and the whole house is on fire and the dog's smiling saying, this is fine. That's not the Christian. The Christian can face reality and yet still have joy in the Lord and not be anxious. How? By thinking. Thinking about what? Thinking about whatever is true. The truth. And so before we jump in, uh, your first point today is a Christian, when we're facing anxiety, we stop and we think. We think about whatever is true. Like, what, who does the Bible say that you are? What does God's word say about why you're here, where you're going, what happens when you die, where you came from? In other words, we think about what is true and we can look at the big questions in life. And we can stop and think about them. Now think about that. (laughs) Imagine going to your local bookstore and finding the self-help section on how to deal with anxiety. Do you think that one of those books that you open up is going to tell you, hey, here's how you deal with anxiety. Think about the big questions in life. No, because unless if you have those answers, it's going to fill you with more anxiety. I was talking with a woman earlier this week and she said she had gone out to, to lunch with her friends who were not Christian. And the questions, those big questions came up. What happens when you die? What's life all about? And they said, we don't know, and we don't think about them. Because otherwise we get filled with anxiety, and we get scared. Christians can think about those truths because we know the answers. What does the Bible say about you? Who are you? Romans chapter 8 says that we, through Jesus, are children of God. Not only are we children of God, but because we're children of God, we are heirs of God. In other words, you get to inherit all of God's stuff. What's his stuff? His kingdom. You inherit the kingdom of God. That's what's coming to to you from the God of this world. And if that wasn't good enough, Romans chapter 8 goes so far to say, not only are you an heir, you are a co-heir with Christ. The inheritance that you are going to receive is the same as Jesus Christ. You want to talk about having worth and value? You want to talk about having security? You get the same inheritance that Jesus does. God's son. You get the same glory, the same life eternal. You get the same honor, the same heavenly joy that Jesus has is yours because the Bible says you are a co-heir with Christ. That is who you are. Where'd you come from? Yes, you were conceived. Yes, you lived in your mother's womb. But the Bible says that God knit us together in our mother's womb. The God of this world is so hands-on in your life that he knit you together in your mother's womb. That's who you came from. The God of this world who isn't far away from you, but is hands-on with you as he knit you together in your mother's womb. Why are you here? have a relationship with the God of this world. The God of this world wants to have a relationship with you, and we get to do that. And then we want to honor and glorify and thank and praise him, to tell others about him, because through Jesus, we get to have a relationship with the God of this world who's created everything. Where are you going? Because of Jesus Christ, who died for you to forgive your sins, who rose from the dead to conquer the grave, You are going to the eternal joys of heaven where you will live with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit in joy, without fear, without anxiety, without worries, because death has been conquered. And there, death will no longer be able to touch any of God's loved ones or your loved ones. That is where you are going. And it's all yours through Jesus Christ, our Savior. 
How does this help you when you're anxious? When you're looking at deadlines. I could lose my job. Yes. But subtract that to what God says about you. It can't take away the fact that you are the heir of God, co-heirs with Christ. That is who you are, and that is what you will receive. Yes, but I just got bad news from the doctor. Yes. And what did Jesus Christ do for you? Conquer the grave so that you have an eternal inheritance, eternal life waiting for you. Yes, but the what-ifs of life with my kids. Yes, it's scary. However, you have the God of this world who loved them so much that he gave his son for them. Standing and sitting and living on the throne of God, ruling all things and working for our eternal good. We stop and we think about the truths of God's word and as we compare it to our situation, it helps us put it into perspective. As we logizomai it, calculate it with the truths of God's word. We stop and we think, Paul says. But not only do we think, we also do this. And now let's jump back up to uh, yeah, sorry, Simon. Can you go back one more? There you go. Verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We not only stop and think, but we also... Pray and thank. We pray and we thank. Notice what Paul says. With prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Isn't that a little odd? Normally we give thanks after we find out the circumstances, right? If I ask you for something, I say please. And then I wait until you do the thing, and then I say thank you. And that's generally how we think of praying to God, right? God, I'm asking for this, and then when the result comes, if I remember, I thank him. But that's not what the order Paul says. Paul says pray and thank. Why do I have reason to give thanks to God right now when I'm anxious and bringing my anxious request to God? Well, let's stop and think. What do we know about our God? He loves you. He cares for you. He sent his son to live, die, and rise again for you. Why? Because he wants you in heaven with him for eternity. And we know what the scriptures say in Romans chapter 8. God works all things for the good of those who love him. God is ruling all things for our good. But do you know the verses right before Romans chapter 8, 28? Verses 26 through 27 say this. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Notice what the Bible says. We do not know what we ought to pray for. That doesn't mean that we go into prayer and we sit there saying, God, I don't know what I should ask. I don't know what I should be praying right now. Uh, but the Holy Spirit knows. No. It means that we may ask for something, but the Holy Spirit knows what we should have asked if we knew the will of God. See, the promise that God makes to us in Romans chapter 8 right there is that even though we ask for something, even though we come with what we think should happen, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us so that God answers our prayers in the way we would have asked them if we knew everything he did. The Holy Spirit takes our prayers and conforms them to the will of God so that God answers our prayers in the absolute best way because we don't know what we ought to pray for. We're not the God of this world. God is. We don't know all things. God does. We have no idea how the intersections of life will impact our life or others' lives, and yet we pray for something that we think we know. 
but the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. And so as we feel that anxiety, as we come to God with our anxious prayers, we say, God, here's what we think, but we thank you that you're going to answer them with our eternal interests at heart in the best way possible because you are God and we are not. I want to give you a, just a, a quick short story about how this wor- an example of this. Back in May, you may have remembered that we had a groundbreaking ceremony for phase two of our building, which is 14 more classrooms and a gym. Uh, we had that in May. At the time, we were on the one yard line with a bank ready to secure financing for the building. We had the groundbreaking ceremony, and a week or so later, the bank called and said, we're not sure about this deal anymore because interest rates went up. You talk about some anxiety, some worry. We started praying, Lord, let, the, let this deal get done. Please, Lord, let this deal get done. And what happened? The deal didn't get done. And we thought, God, what are you doing? We need this. And so over the next three months, we prayed, God, let there be a deal. Let there be a deal. Bank after bank came, no deal, no deal. And then finally, we signed a deal a couple weeks ago with a bank for the best terms for a loan that Divine Savior has ever seen. If that's not good enough, how about this? In those three months, all of a sudden, the people who own the 10 acres of land behind us reached out and said, hey, we want to sell you our 10 acres of land because we don't want it to be developed. We want it to go to the Christian church and school that's behind us. In those three months, our appraisal of our current land and our current building went up. So guess what we could do? We could bundle the 10 acres of land into the new deal of the best loan that Divine Savior has ever seen. Why? All because God said no back in May. Because we thought we knew what was right, and God said, no, 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 there's something better. That's true for you too. That's true for whatever anxieties are weighing on your hearts that you bring to the Lord today. That is true over your health. That's true over your job. That's true over the deadlines that you have to meet. That's true over your family situation. Whatever's on your heart, the Lord knows what you need, and the Holy Spirit prays on your behalf to align your will and your prayers to the will of God. Christians, as we approach God, as we approach this topic of anxiety, what do we do? We stop and we think about the truths of God's word. Little side note, this is why doctrine matters. Not to get off on a huge tangent, but, but there's so many people today that just want to say, all that matters is we know that Jesus loves us and forgives us. Doctrine matters, because without this doctrine, you don't know any of this, other than Jesus loves me. No, doctrine matters. We get to stop and think who we are, where we came from, where we're going, why we're here, and we know those answers because of the doctrine of the Bible. We stop and we think about the truths of God's word. And then we pray and we thank. Because we have a God who is always answering our prayers in the best way possible. And when we do that, what does the Bible say? The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, which goes beyond all of our understanding, will guard our hearts, the seat of emotions, and our minds, the seat of thoughts, in Christ Jesus. Without him, none of this peace is possible. Without him, we are on our own. Without him, we don't know that the God of this world is a loving God. Without him, we don't know that our sins are forgiven. Without him, death isn't conquered. Without him, there's only anxiety and worry. But with him, there is peace that goes beyond any human understanding and it will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Here's how Romans 8 closes For I'm convinced that neither life, neither death, nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If our God is for us, who can be against us? As your hearts are filled with anxiety, stop and think, pray and thank, and the God of peace will be with you and you will receive a peace that transcends all understanding in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. 
Father in heaven, we praise and we thank you for Jesus. It's only because of him that we know that you are a loving God. It's only because of him we know that we're forgiven and death has been conquered. With death conquered, uh, we know that life eternal is ours and that eternal joy of heaven is waiting for us. Fill us with peace today knowing that you are on the throne. You love us. You care for us. Fill us with peace knowing that you're answering our prayers in the best way possible, not only for us, but for everyone involved as you bring us to your side safely in heaven. We want to see your, your will. We want to know your will. Uh, and yet if we can't right now, we ask that your Holy Spirit strengthen our faith uh, that we may know and trust that you have everything under control and that you are working all things for the good of those who love him. Be with us today. Fill our hearts with peace knowing that you are our loving God. In your name we pray. Amen.